A Curse of Silver Written by Joy Lewis Read by the author Chapter 1 When the castle's tower finally toppled to the ground, the smells of singed pages and flesh wafted on the breeze. She felt the impact in the marrow of her bones, but she couldn't stop running. How the morning sun could shine on such a thing? She didn't care to know. She knew without having to see the red banners that the mage hunters were here. The fires were their weapon of choice for an infestation of magic. Smoke laced her lungs. Kitchen staff and castle servants tore past her. No one stopped Everin to tell her she was going the wrong way. Her stomach twisted, and she could feel the mashed corn she'd taken from the kitchen for last night's dinner start to rise in her throat. This is all because of you. In the last few weeks, she'd taken to talking to herself as if she could divide into more than one person, as if she could dissect this new part of her from the rest. Even though it hurt to breathe, Everin didn't stop running until she slammed against the latch door of the stables. As her fingers fumbled with the metal, she exhaled to find that it wasn't yet hot. Maybe her luck would hold further. Maybe someone else had freed the stabled horses once the fire had started to spread through the castle. She passed inside the barn in a blur. Panicked screams clawed through the air. The horses were still here. At once, her hands flew from stall door to stall door, flinging them open as black, brown, and gray shapes moved about in the confined spaces. They whinnied as they raced past her. Her blood throbbed inside her veins, and acrid smoke smeared her nostrils. The fire was getting closer. She knew he was here. She had to get to him. Even though her thoughts ran wild inside her, her hands were steady as she came to the metal latch of the last stall. Where is he? He isn't. Tracker? The stall door swung wide, and Everin's knees nearly buckled. Tracker's white-tipped nose pushed against her throat, and warmth and moisture coated her skin. Unlike his neighbors, He didn't bolt at the first opportunity to escape the disaster approaching. Even so, Tracker's tail swished enough to slam itself against the wood of his stall. An eye as black as a beetle shell watched her. Before she'd switched to a job inside the castle, she'd been responsible for cleaning their stalls. Tracker knew her secrets like no one else. Never mind that he was a horse. They both needed to get far away from the burning castle. Even if she couldn't take Tracker with her, wherever she was supposed to go now, she wanted him to be safe. But, gods, she couldn't think about the kind of future that was before her. Or rather, a lack of one. She had thought she could live out her life here, undetected. Even if that meant she was to be alone. A noise at the other end of the stables turned her stomach. For too many precious seconds, she couldn't move. They've come. They're here. They found me. It was less a decision and more an instinct. Everin dove to the corner of Tracker's stall, where she'd been sleeping unnoticed for months now. Like a good boy, Tracker didn't rear up or whinny at the movement. Everin kept one hand near his flank not daring a whisper. They were silent as bootsteps echoed hollowly in the barn. Everin's other hand tightened into a fist, but her eyes fell on her companion. I can't risk trying it. It could hurt him. It was the thing that was within the part of her that she imagined she could cleave off. She thought of it like an infection, contained to only a part of her body, For now. It had only appeared a few months ago. Everin had been foolish to think she could hide the signs. 
her breath staled in her throat. A shadow had fallen across the stall. Calm, boy. It's only a saddle. Everyn couldn't think anymore. She knew that voice. And it wasn't any mage hunter. Everyn was already on her knees, so she couldn't go any lower. Even so, it felt disrespectful to address him from where she was. My sire. Prince Alaric turned his gaze on her. From where she squatted among damp straw, she could see the gold of his eyes, his lashes brushing against each other as they beheld her in the rough-spun dress that she'd been wearing for several days. Once, the garment had been a pretty shade of wildflower blue. It was gray now, but what he said next froze her racing heart. You're here. His golden eyes, the trait passed down by his royal lineage, didn't blink as they took her in. The prince's mouth lifted at one corner as he murmured, I should have known. Everin hadn't moved since he'd seen her. She didn't think she'd breathed either. Her voice came out hoarse. You must have mistaken me for someone else, your highness. Everin washed plates and cutlery in the castle kitchens. The royal family had never coughed in her direction. The third son of the king had certainly never spoken to her before. As two of a kind, it's past time we made ourselves known to each other, he said in a voice that was velvet. Don't you think? In that moment, the smoke starting to seep inside the barn didn't matter. The mage hunters outside with their red banners and uniforms didn't matter. Her voice was raw from smoke and screams, but she didn't care. You have it too. Silver blood. He must have seen her use it that night. Perhaps in response to the word, the foundation of the building around them shivered. Tracker's head whipped back in Everin's direction, and she could see the white of his teeth as he made a noise that sounded like she'd hurt him. She'd never said the word before. Maybe it was true. Maybe just saying the name of what she was would call on calamity itself. Prince Alaric had stepped fully into the stall. His hands flew across Tracker's back, first as he positioned the riding blanket over his back and then as he affixed the saddle to him. What's going on? It was all that Everin could think to say. She'd risen fully to her feet, but beyond that, she hadn't the slightest idea what she should be doing. She'd entered the stables to evacuate the horses before the fire spread to their stables. There'd been no after. There'd certainly been no this. Prince Alaric is a silver blood. Maybe if she told herself the words enough, she'd start to believe them. What's going on is we're leaving before they burn us alive. Your Majesty, the words spluttered from her when she realized she hadn't been addressing him properly this entire time. You don't need to do this. I'm sure the king could work with the guild on your behalf. For the past 20 years, King Nikhil and Queen Rowan had become the most powerful rulers on the continent. If anyone could bargain for a Silverblood's freedom, it would be the king and queen who had joined two kingdoms with their marriage. The prince's amber-gold eyes were elsewhere. His hands were still busy with saddling Tracker as he said the words. They're dead. All of them. Her mouth tasted of ash. The Guild of Magic study wasn't supposed to interfere with royal affairs, just as the royal family had always agreed to leave the guild to what it did best, study Silverblood, and capture those with it in their veins before they destroyed too much with it. It wasn't supposed to be like this. A new thought occurred to her, and her heart lodged in her throat. They knew to come here because there's two of us. It was the ugly answer. The only reason that Everin or the prince hadn't been able to go on with their lives 
hiding the part of them which made them so dangerous to innocent people around them, was the fact that they had both been here, the silver substance within them, the thing that the guild called magic, was more detectable when more of it was concentrated in one place, and the mage hunter's instruments never lied. Even after she'd woken that morning months ago, in a pool of silver liquid, she'd chosen to remain living her life as a kitchen hand. Instead of fleeing to the farthest, most blurred corner of any map she could get her hands on, she'd wanted to remain the same. She'd wanted to keep the life she'd fought so hard to have. The royal family had been massacred because of her foolish thinking. They tried to protect you. Everin didn't know why she was still talking. She certainly wasn't making him feel any better, she was sure. Prince Alaric's eyes flashed in the dim light. I'm leaving the castle. I'm leaving it all. They won't stop. He'd mounted Tracker and extended a hand to her. Ash had fallen on him and colored his black hair gray in spots, but it was still the darkest shade of black she'd ever seen. None of the boys she had once eyed even compared to him. Everin backed away, and she felt his golden eyes tracking her. She would run, run until her feet cracked and bled. She couldn't lead the mage hunters to the last remaining member of the royal family. She couldn't leave with the prince and think like this anymore. Like she belonged with other people. Silver blood or not, she would always hurt them. I can't. Prince Alaric pulled the edge of something worn and frayed from the interior of his black coat. Even though she couldn't read the writing plainly on the spine, she knew what it was. It was something that was supposed to have been destroyed decades ago. The part of her that wasn't her shuddered at the sight. Even though she'd whispered, her words were too loud. The Book of Dissimulation. Everin's knees almost gave. This was the answer to their problem. The only answer, besides death. The ancient text must have remained in the royal library all these years. It's missing pages. I need you if I'm going to find them. His molten eyes flicked to her face, and his eyebrows rose at what he must have seen there. Unless you've made arrangements to some other prince behind my back already. Her breath flew from her. I'll have to tell him as we pass by. When he helped swing her to Tracker's back, Everin found that she must have forgotten how to breathe. The gods were toying with her. She must have perished on the stone floor of the kitchen. There was little other rational explanation. When they rode for the forest beyond the castle, Everin was sure the trees parted for them. Chapter 2 The night was cold, but it wasn't the first time Everin had slept outside. Nor was it the first time she'd left behind a home. It was, however, the first time she hadn't known what her future held. Her eyes fell on their meager supplies left on the other side of the smoldering fire, and the bundle half hidden from view. The key to any sort of future for them remained inside the pages of the ancient text that Alaric had saved from the castle's library, the Book of Dissimulation. Everin watched as the embers glow flashed and faded to black coals. Enough heat radiated from it to reach her face and body, but she couldn't control the shiver that ran through her. She wished that tracker hadn't left earlier to wander the field north of them for nutrient-rich grass. Are you cold? Everin's heart jumped into her throat. Prince Alaric was standing above her, wearing only a thin shirt clinging to his chest and a pair of trousers. Underneath his shirt, 
She could see the shape of his defined shoulders and chest. She'd never seen him out of the black and gold trim coat that marked him a member of the royal family. Everin moved her eyes to his face when she realized she'd been staring too long at places she shouldn't. I'm fine. But she felt that he hadn't missed the glance. In the shadows of the trees near them, she thought she saw a glimmer in his gold eyes. Is that so? He mused above her. I wasn't aware that fine meant freezing. Everin's mouth opened to object in the same moment that the son of a king crouched to the ground and slipped under the quilt that smelt of horses to lay beside her. What are you doing? Blood rushed to Everin's face. She rolled out from under the quilt on the lightly frosted earth. Her chest was heaving where emotions she didn't care to name tangled inside her. At once, the cold assaulted her, biting at her extremities. She didn't appreciate how both the cold and the prince had teamed up against her. Alaric's eyebrows rose. I can promise you, I'm as chaste as a priest. She sat up, tucking her legs close. Everin's arms crossed against her chest. She squinted at the prince who had stolen her quilt. Why do I have the feeling that's a lie? I can be chaste as a priest, Alaric amended, unless you want something else of me. If there was any part of Everin's face that wasn't red, that wasn't the case any longer. He's too distracting. She fought to conceal the shivers as she said through her teeth. That's not what I meant. What, pray tell, did you mean? Everin focused on the speckles of stars above them. It proved a challenge to look at him and make her point at the same time. I don't want to hurt you. What are you talking about? What's inside of me can hurt people. Even before I was... Her throat lodged with words that wouldn't be spoken. Everin started again. I don't want to hurt you. He was silent so long that she was forced to meet his gaze again. His face revealed no emotion as he asked, Do you think you can hurt me just by sleeping beside me? Everin couldn't reply. She was too sure the answer was yes. The prince continued in her silence. We both carry it in our veins. This is the risk we both pose, to each other and from each other. Everin, the way he spoke her name, was like how autumn winds beckoned to winter. Something shifted in his face. Few could ever hope to experience the sort of power that lives in your veins. Revel in it, or toil under the persecution of others for the very same cause. The choice is yours. Her throat felt hoarse. What did she choose? How did you find out what you were? She asked. She wasn't sure if she asked it because she didn't know what else to say to his words or because she couldn't picture it. But in that moment, she needed to know. A devilish smirk twitched to his lips. Stop freezing yourself and I'll tell you. Everin's arms across her chest were rigid as stone as she crossed the distance that she'd put between them. As you wish, my sire. If this was the game he wished to play, then so be it. As soon as she lifted the edge of the quilt to scoot under it, her body relaxed into the warmth against her will. His arm nearest her almost felt feverish in comparison to her cold skin. Everin jerked her arm from where they'd been touching. This was a prince. Princes didn't sleep next to the girls who washed their dishes in the kitchens. Even so, neither of them moved beyond that. Up close, his gaze was even more sharp. She couldn't hide when he stared at her like that. Her eyes moved elsewhere, even as the sarcasm formed on her tongue. Is this to your standards, my prince? But she had to peek at his face to see his reaction. She swallowed at what she saw. Very. He knows how to distract too well. She'd asked him a question and deserved an answer, prince or no. Tell me then, she said. 
How did you find out that you were? Everyone stopped. She couldn't say the word again. She couldn't risk it. The prince's eyes moved to the shadows draping across their clearing. It was my mother who realized. She must have been trying to protect you from it, Everyn guessed. From what she remembered of Queen Rowan, she'd been a just and fair ruler and loving mother. She was sure the queen would have wanted her youngest child safe from the guild, even if that meant risking the wrath of their hunters if they ever found out what he was. When he didn't say anything, she realized the wounds must have been too fresh. The misstep pained her, and she struggled to find what to say that wasn't about his recently slaughtered family. It happened for me when I woke one morning in the silver. It was the most she was willing to say of the name. She continued, I always thought something like that was caused by something, but it's not. What does it feel like? His eyes were hungry on her. Everin's lips parted and her eyebrows came together. You don't know. It's not strong for me yet. Oh, right. Everin knew only her own experience with it and the whispers and curses she'd heard among the other kitchen hands and the others who had slept in alleys. One of the few things she'd known about silver blood beforehand was that the longer it was allowed to exist in a person, the stronger its power grew, and the greater the danger. It was why the guild stole them away and executed the ones that ran. I acted as if I'd imagined it, but it can't be ignored. Everin's voice was a whisper. It rests inside you like a snake, sleeping until you let it snap. And when you do, it gets fatter, like a mouse bloating a snake's belly. It grows inside you. Everin wasn't sure what possessed her to keep talking, but she couldn't stop herself. The first time, the only time really, was shortly after that. It wanted to be used. I didn't know what was going to happen, of course. I just, I was so angry that night. The coins I'd hidden were gone and she took a breath. If she was going to say it, she needed to say it. It was the pond beyond the castle gardens, the one beyond the trees. She saw it as if it were before her now. It had been a natural pond, unlike the fountains and shallow pools of water that surrounded the castle which had been dug by the gardeners. One moment, it was as it should have been, and the next, it was as if it were midwinter and the surface had frozen over in thick ice. But it wasn't ice. Everin paused. I remember that it turned silver, and it never turned back. The water solidified to something else. I spent the rest of the night and the next day concealing it with bushes and grass. I saw you, he admitted. Or at least what you left behind. A lump formed in her throat. She'd guessed as much when he knew who she was in the horse's stalls. That night had been when she'd known. Silver blood couldn't be ignored but maybe it could be suppressed. Her eyes moved to the bundle across from them, only dimly illuminated by the dying coals. The faded lettering on its side were like runes to her eyes. That's really it, isn't it? And the guild has suggested that they had it all this time. When she tried to meet his gaze, his golden eyes that marked him unmistakably as the king's son moved to the book. Instead of answering her question, he asked, What do you know of this book? The Book of Dissimulation? In truth, she'd thought it was another rumor, like silver blood. How wrong she'd been. Evren remembered back to those rumors, the tales traded by the other kitchen hands about exactly what treasures the royal family must have been hiding in that gilded library of theirs. It can hide who we are, the power, Everin said. It's supposed to stifle it, and maybe more. It tells of a ritual involving magic. Prince Alaric's eyes stared through hers as he spoke. 
even without those missing pages. It's clear that's where this is heading. She remembered he'd been studying the text ever since they'd left the castle. She'd even leafed through the book herself, even though she couldn't read. But the thought of a magical ritual was enough to curdle the contents of her stomach. She'd had enough anything so-called magical for a lifetime. Would you rather be hunted for your silver blood for the remainder of your life and be a danger to yourself and anyone around you? Her eyes fell on the prince, and she knew the answer. It was a feat to pull her chin up and appear resolute from under a horse's quilt, but she thought she managed it. Fine, she said. If we're going to go through with this, Everin, Prince Alaric said, and she watched the way his mouth said her name with an odd fascination. Promise me something. But only if you'll mean it. She swallowed. What is it? What's inside that book? What we're going to do will be permanent. Promise me that you want this. That whatever future awaits us on the other side of these pages is one that you want. Everin only hesitated a moment. I promise. Chapter 3 It was a month before they found them. Or maybe it was a season. Everin hadn't tracked the days like she'd promised herself she would. The nights under the broad expanse of stars where the prince had been entrancing. During the days, she traversed through bookshops in every village, township, and city marked on the map that Prince Alaric had managed to save from what had once been his home. Every time, the prince had stayed well away from each settlement to ensure their identities remained hidden. Or so they'd hoped. They still hadn't found one of the missing pages, but something else had found them tonight. As Everin bundled as many of their supplies as she could within her arms, she considered what had given them away, or rather, who. As she mounted Tracker behind Prince Alaric, she heard the strange noises in the woods around them. Her front pressed into his black coat, and she was sure he could feel her heart hammer through the fabric of their clothes. The mage hunters were on them, was it the librarian in Sarchet? The din of their raised voices bounced against the surface of the tree trunks surrounding them. Everin's breathing quickened. Soon, there would be near enough to them for her to hear their words. Perhaps it had been the bookseller in Ritterant. There had been many more curious objects in her store rather than books. Everin bit down on her tongue, hard enough to make her gasp. She couldn't allow herself to fall apart just because the mage hunters had found them. Until they found the last pages of the Book of Dissimulation, this was their life. If they ever found them. It was then she realized Tracker wasn't outpacing them. Her words came out in a single breath as Tracker leapt over a fallen log. How can we lose them? In her arms. His body was tense like a loaded crossbow. She was never as close to him as she was when they rode. It made her nervous, being this close to another person, least of all a prince. Before Prince Alaric could answer her, a shout to their direct south soared through the trees to them. Surrender your prisoner! Her jaw slackened a degree. They thought her a ransomer? He leaned into her when he spoke. They're trying to trick us. She'd heard tales of the mage hunters' cunning and ruthlessness. They were masters at getting what they wanted. She heard another voice join in. Release the prince or your life will be forfeit. They would kill us both. Prince Alaric veered Tracker in a sharp turn away from the new voice. She heard what went unsaid in his words. The names of his family that they'd already slain. King Nikil, Queen Rowan, and the eldest prince. A bolt arced above their heads, causing leaves to spill over them as they glided over the ground. It was the kind of shot that was deliberate. A warning, 
or a demonstration. Everyone's teeth clamped together. Their trickery wouldn't work with them, but their weapons might. You feel it even now, don't you? The pull of it. She barely heard the prince's words over the shouting of their pursuers. Breath caught in Everin's throat. What are you saying? But she knew. The silver blood in her had stirred like a snake, dancing. As if it would do what it wanted. As if it had wants. I'm not strong enough with it yet. Alaric's voice caught between gritted teeth. Between his words... She heard what he was asking. Everin had never killed. In all the years she'd lived on the streets and when she'd still been small enough to sleep in barrels, she'd never brought herself that low. Before she'd been hired as a kitchen hand, she'd lied and stolen her fill, but never killed. She remembered her mother in her last days, the oversized sleeve draping her arm as she held it out for Everin. Her skin had been uncomfortably warm, but she couldn't take her hand away. She'd given her that sickness. Everin had recovered, and so she'd assumed Mother would. Her eyes flicked around her, seeing the woods again. Everin, they're going to kill us. The bravado and charm were gone from Alaric's voice. Trucker screamed as an arrow skimmed his flank, nearly piercing it through. Everin didn't think. Thought left her like roaches under a light. She'd never purposefully called on it before, and she didn't now. All she did was turn at her waist, her hands still locked around the prince's middle while she faced the direction behind them. She'd thought it had started as a scream. She wasn't sure what it had ended like. The force of it propelled the three of them even farther than Tracker had jumped. Everin's head slammed against something too solid, and disorientation sliced through her. In a blink, the forest was changed. She was silent as her eyes devoured the scene that stretched on and on, even farther than she could see. The trees behind them had been reduced to stumps, smoke trails still lingering over some. The ones on the periphery that had survived had been cracked at their middle, and Everin was struck by how human-like they seemed, as if they were bending down to pluck something. The second thing she noticed was the gray. It was everywhere. In a panic, she looked to the skies for proof that her color side hadn't been stolen as a price for calling on that part of her but even the heavens seemed more charcoal than black. Alaric's voice pierced the silence. It's the silver blood. The world seemed to shiver at the word. She didn't even realize she had been trembling. She didn't remember when Alaric had slipped off tracker either. His forehead pressed against hers, and a sea of gold engulfed her vision. As best as they could estimate, The destruction stretched well on for a mile, but they stopped before they could find the outer boundary of the site. When they found signs of their pursuers' bodies, her knees pressed against the ground that she'd made barren as she heaved. Under a moonless sky, Prince Alaric led them from the patch of empty gray woods to a new forest. They rode until dawn, and even after that, Tracker passed through a shallow creek before stopping. They should have been riding to the next settlement. Everin knew this. She also couldn't stop shaking when she dropped to the ground after dismounting Tracker. When his arms found her, she discovered he still carried the smell of wood fire on him, even though that, too, was a remnant of the ruination that now followed them. She inhaled the smell like it was fresh air. You had no other choice, he murmured in tones as soft as the wind brushing the leaves. His fingers teased out some of her auburn strands that had tangled to her scalp in the night. It had to be done. There was nothing to say in response. 
He held her until the sobs receded, and after, too. If there was anything Everin still knew, it was that she needed those pages. She needed the ritual to smother her silver blood, permanently. If she didn't, it would grow every day that it was allowed to remain a part of her. A mile of gray, dead forest land would become a settlement. From a settlement, a kingdom. Chapter 4 Everin's hand grazed the spines, the leather of the bindings pleasant to her touch. The oil lamp nearest the shelf cast a wavering light over everything. Her eyes scanned the wall of books. Despite herself, despite the danger they were in, coming to another settlement so soon after the attack, she smiled. Her hand flicked back the spine of one particularly worn-looking book, and she rescued it from where it had been shoved among the others. The writing on the front was embossed in loops and curves, and the pages inside were light and papery. Everin liked to pretend she could read them. She should be leaving. She'd already passed the note to the bookseller at the desk, and he'd already informed her that he hadn't even heard of what she was seeking. Can I help you? Before her was the bookseller, the one that had taken one look at the note Alaric had written and refuted the very existence of the book they possessed. She knew from Alaric what the note said. She carried the same one to every bookshop and library. She was an assistant to a collector of rare and forgotten books, searching on his behalf for the missing pages of the infamous Book of Dissimulation. They didn't claim to have the book itself, which Alaric had explained would have been too risky a claim to make, even if most would have laughed at the idea. Everin's palm shoved the spine of the book back among its fellows as she blurted, No, thank you. I was browsing, but I should be going now. There was a strange look to the book merchant's eyes that made Everin want to drop the pretense of civility between them and leave without another word. This one was only a few years older than her. Most of the book merchants in other towns had been plying their trade for so many years that they needed the thickest spectacles that Everin had ever seen in her life in order to see. It made her grateful she'd never learned to read. In a voice that was at once a whisper and too rough to be called such, he said, Do you know what it is you're looking for? Breath stuck in her throat. She said, Of course, but seeing as you don't have it, you can't read, can you? Everin's sweat-coated back pressed against the stacks. She regretted ever picking up a book in this shop. That's none of your business, she said between her teeth. You know the basics, he said in his gritting knot whisper. Some letters, perhaps. That's got nothing to do with, where is he? Something cold solidified in her stomach. Her eyes moved about the shop. She knew the mage hunters would materialize at any moment. They'd been discovered. The merchant's eyes were unreadable as they watched her reaction. Where is your book collector master? Breath released from her. Maybe he didn't realize who they were. Maybe he thought she was a simple errand girl and assistant after all. They appeared to be alone in the shop but Everin kept her knuckle near the dagger hidden in the inside of her trousers. Whatever this bookseller was intending, it couldn't have been benign. Her eyes narrowed at him. He's close by, she said in what she hoped sounded like a threat. His reaction unnerved her. The bookseller stepped back from her, acting as if he hadn't interrogated her against the book stacks seconds earlier. I see I misunderstood your request, madame. Allow me to search through our special collections. Everin hadn't relaxed by the time the young bookseller had returned, and she didn't budge when he'd tried to exchange her money for a string-tied envelope. With some force, 
He'd shoved it into her closed fist. Thank you for your business. I would highly suggest you check the contents yourself before passing them to your master. I'm sure you wouldn't want to incur his wrath by presenting to him the wrong thing. Everin was gone from the shop before he could say another thing to her. Despite the warmth on her skin, from the sun of her head and the smells of cooking meat and bread that she loved about civilization, her heart raced. She hadn't been exactly truthful when she'd told him that Alaric was close by, but what of the bookseller's reaction? What had any of it meant? As she raced through the cobbled streets of the town, her eyes flew to every alleyway and passerby who happened to glance at her. The mage hunters would have been after them by now, she assured herself. But she couldn't force herself to stop looking for them in every face and shadow. Her thumb smoothed out the rough paper material of the envelope. This bookseller had been the most peculiar by far, she decided. I'm sure you wouldn't want to incur his wrath by presenting to him the wrong thing. Everin shook her head. She should have been drunk on giddiness, or at least skipping down the streets by now. There was no book collector master. There was no wrath to incur. Alaric wouldn't be incensed with her if this town proved as unfruitful as the others. Either the envelope in her hand contained one of the missing pages, or it didn't. Either way, Tracker would take them to a new area in a few days' time. They'd take some days to allow any reports of their likenesses to die down, and then Everin would walk into the next library or bookshop with Alaric's handwritten note in her palm as they sought the last page. You can't read, can you? Everin's lips pressed together as heat rushed to her cheeks where the sun had already warmed them. What did that matter? But how had he known? She was approaching the edge of town, the name of which she'd long forgotten by now. There had been so many. Soon, she could tell Alaric all about her strange and eventful time here. One of her canines hooked into her tongue. Her eyes rested on the horizon before her. Her body continued to walk straight as her brain instructed it, but one of her hands worked independently of the rest of her. Inside the envelope, she found two slips of paper. Chapter 5 For the first few days, Alaric had been inseparable from the page, bent over it while he tended to the coals of their fire. Everin wasn't sure why she hadn't shown him the second piece of paper the bookseller had slipped her. After all, it wasn't as if she could read it. Not really, anyway. What if it's the last page of the book? But she'd already assured herself otherwise. One page had yellowed from age, and although she couldn't understand what was written on it, Everin recognized the flourish of letters as the same style that the rest of the book had. But the other piece of parchment was newly written. Some of the ink had even smudged when it had been folded and placed inside the envelope. The bookseller had written the note for her. Her mouth came down. He had recognized that she wasn't literate. So, the bookseller was mocking her. The knowledge was enough to sour the feeling that had soared in her at seeing Alaric's face when she'd presented him the page. She'd hidden the note in her pocket, like she could hide away everything that made her so different from the prince. She ran her fingers roughly through her tangles. For some reason, she felt that prince's hair must not tangle. Prince Alaric's regular breathing from where he laid beside her tickled her. She watched how the moonlight poured across his features. When the ritual worked, and when they were both free of the silver blood that marked them for death, what then? Would he go back to being a prince? Would she go back to washing dishes in two warm kitchens? Or would they carve out a life like this? and leave their former lives behind, together on Tracker's back. Could someone like him be content with someone like her? 
Somehow, neither scenario seemed right to her. Her thumb slipped inside her pocket, and she retrieved the note. Maybe she couldn't change the fact that she'd grown up on rotted apples and molded bread. She couldn't change who she'd been. She could change who she was. She could be closer to his equal. Everin slipped from under their shared quilt closer to the fire. Against its dying light, her eyes traced the curves and lines until they ached. The sounds of the flame muffled the ones she made with her mouth as it formed shapes she'd nearly forgotten. When morning light pierced the sky above, she hadn't slept. What does this say? Alaric paused where he was placing the materials on the tree stump between them. It had taken them weeks to acquire all that was needed for the ritual. They were still one page short, but Alaric had puzzled out that the missing pages detailed not one ritual, but two, or two stages of the same one. After this part, the silver blood within them would be dulled. The second part of the ritual would snuff it from their veins entirely. In that time, Everin had studied the bookseller's note and discovered something. On it was written all the letters of the alphabet. Simple sketches and words were paired together on the back. She smiled to herself. The other day, she'd spelled sack. It was the first word she'd learned. Everin was waiting until she could write properly before telling him she'd been learning to read. Alaric's eyebrows came together. It says conceal. Why do you ask? Everin frowned. She'd been certain there'd been at least one S in that. Conceal silver blood. That's what it says. At least I know what the words are now. No reason, she said, but she still hadn't looked up. You're nervous. All at once, Everin felt a warm hand cup her chin. Her heart stuttered in her ribs. That's natural. His gold eyes left her face, but it didn't help her heart rate. I am too. It was time she reached for the future she was keeping locked in her dreams. I want to do it, she whispered. Start the ritual. Do you trust me? Yes. Alaric's palm pulled away from her, and she resisted the urge to bring it back to her. He rifled through the sack on the ground before producing a sharp knife, the one she kept on her when she traveled inside towns and villages. In his other hand was a glass flask. I'll need to collect some blood, he said. She heard what he meant, and she didn't correct him. Evra nodded and allowed Prince Alaric's careful fingers to face her palm sunward. When the slice of pain came, she bit down on her lip and closed her eyes. She didn't have blood anymore. She didn't need to see it coming out of her to know. Alaric wrapped a bandage tied around her hand after. When she opened her eyes, he was examining the flask in his fist. Some of mine's in here as well. His golden eyes flicked to her face. I need you to stay still for this part. Alaric's thumb stoppered the top of the glass as he flipped it upside down. Although he tried to hide it, Everin saw him flinch when it must have made contact with his thumb. The skin came away silver. Everin didn't dare breathe. His thumb traced lines on her face. When he was done, he repeated it on his own features, sweeping his thumb from his nose to his lip and around his eyes. Hers felt like tears wet on her cheekbones. Are you ready? She gave a nod, though nothing could have prepared her for his palm pressing against her skin. His longest finger rested under her collarbone. Her pulse pounded at the contact. She was certain he could feel her heartbeat. He spoke to the empty forest around them. A call on the silver blood. It was all he could say before the ground rumbled and the winds drowned out his words. Everything shuddered as what appeared to be all the world's birds took flight above them. Everin tried to speak, 
but the ground shifted again and her head swam. Her mouth was still pulling in a gasp as she collided with the ground. What's going on? Evren's mouth tasted dry, and when her eyes snapped open, the world around them was moving. She'd been slumped against Alaric's chest. Under them, Tracker galloped. They're after us again. Alaric's teeth were gritted, and his eyes flicked left and right, but Evren couldn't see them. What happened? Her memory blurred together. Had the ritual happened? Was this a part of it? Her hand went to her face and came away wet. She looked down to see gleaming silver smudged into her skin, bright like moonlight. How'd they find us? She couldn't get enough questions out. Alaric's gold eyes moved away from her face. You were screaming. Something curdled in her stomach. Tracker panted as branches scratched at her skin. Everyone heard them at last, the shouts and sounds of their horses tramping the ground. Their enemies hadn't yet caught up to them, but there could be no mistake. They were surrounded. The cacophony came from every direction. She couldn't do this again. Her throat closed around her air. She couldn't kill more of them. She wouldn't. If the ritual worked, I might not be able to. There might not be enough of it left inside me for that. Warm breath tickled her ear. Can you do it again, Silvervane Princess? Can you save these three lives? Everin couldn't think. There was unstifled emotion in his voice that would have been sacrilege to name. She silenced the thoughts clamoring inside her, begging to be acknowledged. She twisted where she sat in front of Alaric. His quick breaths were on her cheek, and the world raced by faster than she could understand it. Everin clamped her knees against Tracker and raised one open palm where she heard the hunters approaching fastest. Silver blood, she spoke in her mind, calling to the fat snake coiled in her belly. But the woods continued to race by, and their shouting was almost audible to her now. Everin nearly fell from Tracker in shock. It was then that a streak of silver passed through the air from where her palm had been raised. It dissolved into something thinner than water vapor. Her lips parted, and she felt even more lightheaded than when she'd woken. It's nearly gone, she said in a whisper. Everin swallowed something down. It had worked. She was almost normal again. They were going to die. The two thoughts collided in her simultaneously. This was to be her freedom and future all at once. And if she was going to die here, she wanted to enjoy it. She only had to twist at her middle to do it. Everin's mouth was against his, tasting him. If she pulled away now, she could claim it had been an accident. As his fingers tangled in her hair, she knew she couldn't go back. Heat rose from her belly and into her throat. He took from her just as she had from him, tilting her head as if she were a cup he drank from. Alaric pulled away at last, clamping Everin to himself by their waists and shoved his palm to the sky. Something shot into the heavens like a meteor. Everin watched, unable to comprehend as it fragmented into millions of pieces above their heads. All the world went gray. Her heart froze in her chest, and she scrambled to protect herself from the blast. Things like tree trunks broke around them. Other things did too, and she forced herself to listen. Would this kill the three of them too? Her head pressed against Tracker's hide as she clung to him. She didn't understand. When the world quieted again, Everin lifted her head. Alaric had been knocked from Tracker, but he didn't look injured. He looked. She banished the thought rattling inside her brain. Shaking, she dismounted from Tracker. To her relief, she found him uninjured when she ran her hands over his smooth hide. She turned to the prince. Are you hurt? 
Alaric's head snapped to her from where he'd been staring around him, speechless. When he looked at her then, she saw a glimpse of something behind his gold veneer eyes. It reminded her of when she'd seen a wild cat in the forest beyond the castle. Never blinking. Focused. Hungry. Don't be ridiculous. He's in shock, like you. Maybe more so than I am, she thought, remembering the kiss. I'm fine, he said at last as he came to his feet. Her eyes couldn't stop moving. It was as if a harvest scythe of an unimaginable size had reaped the trees to their stumps. How far did it go? Everyone felt like a fish were swimming inside her stomach. They needed to know. We should check that this hasn't reached a town. We should... Warm fingers clamped around her wrist. We're running. Just as we always have. They're going to kill us for this. Her pulse raged faster inside her veins. She couldn't stop thinking on it. A settlement becomes a mile of gray, dead forest land. Then it consumes a kingdom. She pulled her hand away. She needed to think straight. She needed to see something green, blue, or brown again. How was this possible? She didn't care how loud she was being anymore. The ones who had chased them were dead. Everything in hearing distance was dead. Did the ritual not work? Did you know it wouldn't work? Even as she said it, she knew it was false. It had worked for her. What remained of her silver blood was an echo of what had been there before. She looked at him. How can you say that? His voice was low. I want this gone as much as you. He stepped farther from her, and she hated the look he gave her then. She wanted more than anything for him not to look at her like that. I'm sorry, I know, but... She shook her head, unable to continue. Tracker's regular breathing near her face helped calm her. She closed her eyes. What had she meant? With her eyes still closed, she felt his light touch at her arms. Soon, he whispered only loud enough for her. This will be a dream. And as she pushed her head against her chest, she felt his quickening heartbeat and knew it to be true. Chapter 6 Everin's brow creased. She was close to reading the faded letters on the last missing page of the book. She'd deciphered a few words, but none important. She'd lost the page the bookseller had given her sometime between the ritual and escaping the hunters. Her fingers strayed to the pocket where it had last been, mourning its loss. It had been a stroke of luck that the next city they'd traveled to had been the one. Alaric had gone into the city this time. He'd explained that, even if he was recognized and caught, he could resist the guild's hunters. Everin had been sick with worry the entire time, but what he'd brought back with him had been worth it. Everin pressed her forehead to her knees where she sat on the dewy morning grass. They'd survive that day, if barely. Silver-veined princess. She could feel the heat spread across her cheeks at the memory. Between escaping the guild and finding the last page, there hadn't been time to talk about their kiss. But there was something else bothering her. It's just your nerves, she told herself. It will be fine. Coming to her feet, she walked under the low boughs of the oak she'd been sitting under. Daylight had started to dress the land in brighter hues, coloring in shadows. They were far, far away from civilization now. The last structure had been the desolate stone ruins two days earlier. They would do it right this time. It's ready, Alaric announced. He got to his feet where he'd been on the quilt. She hadn't seen him this excited since, well, ever. Soon, we'll create a new way forward, one without destruction and despair at her hands. But she still needed to know something. Alaric, she said, approaching the prince. His head snapped up. Yes. What's going to happen? 
after this. For a moment, he looked utterly unrecognizable to her. His gold veneer gaze narrowed on her, and his lips thinned. The expression was gone by the time he'd closed the gap between them. You don't think we can handle it? Her lips came together. Handle it? It was around then that he pressed against her. His breath raised the hairs on the back of her neck as he said, There's no one out here to harm Everin. Only us this time. She relaxed into him. He was right. They'd made certain of that and their scouts. They pulled apart, and he picked up the objects on the ground, the book with its aged binding, and the dagger. She wanted this future, and she was too close not to get it now. Everin grinned. She'd never had a home like him. Everin passed him the last missing page of the Book of Dissimulation, and he slipped the frayed edge against the interior binding, closing the book as he did so. Do you trust me? It was the same question he'd asked her before the first ritual. She didn't hear him. Her eyes were on the title of the book. It was the first time since she'd started to read that she'd seen its cover. The embossed letters were in an older style, embellished with unnecessary flourishes that made her familiar letters look alien, difficult to read, but not impossible. For the first time, she started to understand. This wasn't the book she'd thought it was. Everin? At her name, she startled. In his hands were not only the book, but the only weapon between them. Everin made a decision, even as her mouth said something else entirely. Of course I do. Her eyes were still on the book, but she didn't think he'd noticed. She had to get the weapon in her hands. Everything would be better then. Thoughts raced from her like water from a cracked pot. She had to make a plan here and now. She knew too much. Everin thrust her hands out. Can I help? Prince Alaric's palm was against her face, stroking her cheek. There's nothing to fear, my love. I know there's not. Everin tried and failed to suppress a shiver. His golden eyes unfocused her like strong drink. But I'd feel better if I helped this time. He passed her the ancient book and took the knife in his dominant hand as he drew apart the strings of his tunic. She opened it to where he'd indicated, to the two pages that had been torn out. Alaric offered her a smile that slowly reached the edges of his mouth. He looked how nameless boys had smiled at her before. She wished that's all he was. Her heart raced as he pushed the cotton from his bare skin. His chest was as beautiful as the rest of him, with smooth skin quivering with his own heartbeat. I'll do it first to show you, he said. We'll need to speak the words in the book to start the incantation. Fortunately, I've memorized that part, so you'll repeat them after me. Everin wasn't satisfied, but she smiled back. The prince was lying to her, and she didn't know why yet. She needed more time. What about the knife? She wondered out loud. She swallowed, letting some of her anxiety seep through. Last time. Alaric nodded. You're right. We'll need to make a cut on each of us again but I'll try to make it as painless and shallow as possible. You'll show me first? Alaric smiled at her question. Yes. Just repeat the words after me, the prince started. I call on that which was given to me, so I may offer thanks. Everin's mouth repeated the phrase verbatim. The problem was, these were not the words written in the book below. The facts squatted in her mind as a goblin would have. Unwanted. Undeniable. She had to buy time. She had to understand what the words at her fingers said. You can't read, can you? The bookseller hadn't been mocking her. He'd been trying to teach her to read. He'd wanted her to know something. What's wrong? At the sound of Alec's voice, 
she realized she hadn't repeated the next phrase he'd fed her. She hadn't even heard what he meant her to repeat this time. She floundered for what to say. It's a lot of words to remember. It is, he agreed. Less at once, then. She peeked at the text in her hands while he was distracted. There was one word that repeated over and over. It was the one he'd told her had meant to conceal. It started with an S. I give what has been given, Alaric said. She recited the phrase, only sparing a glimpse at the real words in the book below. There were so many of them, and none of the ones she knew helped her. And conceal this part of me, he said. And conceal this part of me, she repeated. He brought the knife out again, allowing the weak sunlight to glint off its steel. That completes this part. She'd lost. There was no more time. Everin didn't know his intention or what this ritual was calling upon. Think, what do you know? What she knew was that she was utterly alone with Prince Alaric. He'd proven that to her already. She knew that he held their only weapon and that silver blood ran strong in his veins. Everin bit the tip of her tongue. Those thoughts hadn't helped except to show her how much power over her the prince had now. You know that the last ritual worked. But that wasn't quite true, was it? She frowned. Her silver blood had nearly left her, but the same couldn't have been said for the prince. Maybe it worked, but not for the reason I think. A thought sparked inside of her. As he waited wordlessly on her, she managed to speak. Show me what to do next, without pain, she added. As you wish, Prince Alaric said. He turned the sharp edge towards him. It was all Everin saw before she averted her eyes to the open text in her hands. Wherever he was cutting on his skin, he was sure to take care of doing it. It wouldn't afford her much time, but it was the best she had. Silently, Everin mouthed out the words, stopping as she came to the one that had confounded her from the start. She pieced together the sounds. She stared at the sentence at her fingers. It was all she could do. In order to fully transfer the power of silver blood to oneself, a final sacrifice is necessary. Her head was dizzy. She read it over again, but the meaning didn't change. It stared back at her dully. It was the smell that first alerted her. Silver blood was in the air. Everett's head darted up. She fought to control her expression, but she felt she'd lost the battle. Prince Alaric had been watching her the entire time. Words bubbled to her lips, but he spoke first. Are you ready? I'll do yours for you. A shallow cut was carved below his throat. One corner of it dribbled a thin line of silver. Her, silver blood. The word waited on her tongue, unspoken like a weapon. But even as she nearly spoke it out loud, she remembered the wisp she'd managed when the mage hunters had been pursuing them. In the blast that he'd managed. There was little doubt in her mind that she shouldn't allow him near her with the blade. As if she were dreaming, she couldn't move as he approached her. Drops of silver fell into the earth from the steel. His fingers were at the base of her throat, where her heart lodged. They paused, poised at the first button of her shirt. What do these words mean? She breathed into his face. I'll teach you after. He cupped her face in one of his hands, one thumb running across her lower lip. His other hand fell to the knife, hovering over her skin. His thumb was still on her lip as she said, I thought losing so much of your family would give you nightmares. The world seemed to slow as she continued. But you sleep so soundly. Her eyes flickered to the page one last time. The letters flowed as words through her mind. Kill the subject with the knife blessed by river water. There was enough time to grab the hilt of the weapon and angle it away from her, but she couldn't free it from his grasp. She dropped the book around their feet. 
She felt it before she saw it. The sound of the slap reverberated against the trees surrounding them. Pain stung her cheek, and tears clouded her vision, but she couldn't let go. I will do worse, the prince snarled. Release the knife. She didn't bother responding as she dug an elbow into his stomach. The pressure at her wrist grew to an unbearable degree as he squeezed. She released the hilt of the knife with a sharp gasp. Her chest heaved at her defeat. Everin was strong, but Alaric had been stronger. He circled her now, the knife still coated in silver blood as he held it low. Abruptly, he stopped. His expression was still that of the boyish prince who had shared her quilt. Come, and I'll make it quick. Painless. Run, and I can't promise that, he said. Everin took one step, and then another. It was the only path before her. She was within arm's distance of him when she spoke. Did Queen Rowan beg for mercy when her youngest son killed her? It had been a guess, and a guess was a poor thing to stake a life on. But it was enough. The knife slid from his slack fingers and into hers. She dodged his retaliation in the same second while gripping the knife and aiming for him. But what he did next froze her. His fingers were smeared in the silver from his chest. He'd raised his palm in warning. I will kill us both with it, Alaric promised, and everything around us. Breath left her lungs. Before she spoke, she hadn't known the truth of it. But her words stirred something in her belly, solid and hungry. You can't hurt me with what's mine. And she opened his throat spilling silver until only red was left. This has been an On The Track Studios production of A Curse of Silver, read and written by Joy Lewis, text copyright 2022 by Joy Lewis, audio copyright 2023 by Joy Lewis. All rights reserved. This is a work of fiction. Visit joylewisauthor.com for more information. Thank you for listening.